Christ Universe in Warsaw, which I would have Uh, ladies and gentlemen, with the great pleasure and uh, huge responsibility as the head of research group in the Central European Process Network 2023 in the group of the Migration Challenges Legal Responses, it's my personal pleasure to welcome you very warmly to today's Oxford debate. I also warmly welcome the audience which assemble before screen our debate is broadcast in the social media. The event is organized with the support by the several units. The first, the Central European Academy from Hungary, main organizer research program, Central European Professors Network. Second, the Scientific Circle of Criminal Procedure, or Procedure of Faculty of Law and Administration of the Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski University in Warsaw, which I am the supervisor. Third, the Institute of Justice in Warsaw, and four, the honorary patronage of this event is assumed by the Department of Criminal Procedure by the uh, Faculty of Law and Administration of Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski University in Warsaw. Ladies and gentlemen, the topic of today's meeting is Migration Challenges Legal Responses. It is an extraordinary honor for me to start the third edition of the Oxford debate. Yes, it is the third edition of Oxford debate. Yes, the time goes quickly and for this moment he brings to us only good memories connected to this event. I only short mention that two years ago in the framework Oxford debate we discussed about fake news and a years ago we discuss about privacy law. It can be said that the debate initiated two years ago today is small tradition and I'm extremely pleased that we have initiated a unique series of Oxford debate in which we will argue with students from foraging universities, mainly from the Central, Central Europe. Now, in today's Today, Oxford debate will feature two teams from Central Europe, consists from students from Hungary, Slovakia, Croatia and Romania, and of course, Poland. With the tremendous pleasure, in this debate, I am the coach of the Polish team. The main goal of the event is to draw the attention of European citizens to important and relevant topics related to the future Europe and Central Europe in particular. In addition, today's debate aims to give young researchers the opportunity to present different and thoughtful ideas and also to analyze the legal systems of the, their, their countries as well as European law regarding the immigration situation. It is necessary to look at this issue from the perspective of young researchers who, with their fresh point of view, can see the opportunities and treats that 
he next decade of the 21st century brings. I have no doubt migration is an integral part of the world. It's obvious. Uh, we spread a global process that increasingly affects every country in the world. But migration as a process has to be rational and predictable. The so-called refugee crisis that Europe has been dealing with since last year has created great confusions in understanding and distinguishing between the various phenomena related to migration. Migration has been and will be, but the main role of the state in the migration process is to create a migration environment that will be primarily beneficial for the state and its citizens. This must be done with respect for history, principle of life, law, and mentality of nations that will suffer another additional burden of accepting migrants. So, my friends, at this point, I would like to give the floor to our honor and eminent guests. In Warsaw, Mr. Professor Janosz Adeshilagi, director of Ferenc Math Institute of the Comparative Law and from University of Miskolc, who will make a welcome speech on behalf of the Central European team. Professor is the coach of this team. Mr. Professor, the floor is yours. Dear Professor Jelets, and you, thank you so much for this opportunity. And first of all, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to the organizers. Previously, uh, you uh, man, uh, mentioned numerous organizers, but of course, in this case, I would like to refer to the Polish organizers, IBS, and of course, to the UKSW. Uh, thank you so much for organization activity and for the invitation uh, as to this high level, uh, uh, high, high level event. Uh, I think that uh, it was a great idea to involve in the activity of the uh, senior researchers of the uh, professors network members to involve the activity of young researchers. Um, I think uh, it's extremely important uh, that as to uh, this quite uh, uh, important topic could be represented also by the young uh, researchers. Uh, I would like to, however, I would like to emphasize that uh, nowadays it's it's a really important social topic. Unfortunately, it's also a quite important political issue. However, uh, please do not forget that now we are here as professionals, uh, and in this case, we would like to deal with this issue um, uh, at professional level. And of course, we are uh, we are interested. Uh, as to uh, your opinion in, uh, in connection with this. And uh, after uh, emphasizing uh, the role of the Polish organizers, now I would like to express my gratitude uh, to the young researchers. Uh, and uh, I wish uh, all the best to you, uh, to all of you, uh, to the Polish partners, to the po Polish young uh, uh, colleagues, and also uh, to my colleagues from the Central European Academy. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Professor. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are very slowly approaching to the start of the big start of today's debate. So let me turn as usual year by year to our brave Central European and Polish debaters. Dear young scientists, I'm very pleased that with what willingness and openness you are ready to present your view here in Warsaw. I don't know if you know where we are. We are an original arbitration room in Poland. Thanks to the courtesy of the National Chamber of Commerce, we are in a real courtroom. Look around. I assure you, in the seats where you are sitting, the parties to the legal dispute have clashes many times in small or big complicated legal issues. Like in a legal, legal court, all the debaters are sitting opposite each other. They see each other. They feel each other's eyes on them. So present your arguments, fight with arguments, go to the true 
present your points of view, argue for the common good. I congratulate on your courage and wish you open minds, brilliant answer, controversial conclusions, and clever plays. I would like to give the floor to the Mrs. Joanna Klimchak, who will moderate this today debate. Thank you for your attention, and I wish all participants interesting delibera deliberation and got good luck for us. Joanna, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am pleased to warmly welcome you at the debate named Migration Challenges Legal Responses. My name is Joanna Klimczak and I am your moderator. In the beginning, I would like to introduce the teams. To start with the Polish team, I am pleased to introduce Mr. Um, Professor Marcin Wielec and uh, Tomasz Bojanowski, Agata Wrubel, Joanna Tomczuk and Julia Starebrat. And from the Central European team, I am also pleased to welcome um, Mr. Professor uh, Janos Edeshilagi, uh, Rebecca Lila Hasanova, Agata Schekers, Lea Feuerbach, and Zofia Farkas. And now I will give the floor to Bartłomiej Oranziak, who will present the rules of the Oxford debate. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I also welcome. Uh, my role is the same in uh, all three editions. Um, so, I will present uh, Oxford debate rules. So, attention please. Um, two main areas, as you know. The first is to strike a balance refugee versus migrant. The second is EU versus member states' competencies in refugee and migration law. This is limits, use and boundaries. Uh, there are two teams, uh, one from Poland and one from Central, Central Europe. Uh, four speakers each, five minutes for each speeches and each area has eight specific issues. Each specific issue is presented by one speaker from each uh, team and speeches are presented uh, alternately. Uh, the order of speeches is decided by the host of the Oxford debate. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the rules of the Oxford debate have been presented and uh, personally I wish the participants the best of luck and the audience a lot of pleasure. Thank you so much. We will have two main issues of today's debate. We will start of the first one with is to strike a balance, refugee versus migrant. Ladies and gentlemen, please for attention. Now let the first speaker from Polish team to describe the topic, clarification of the concept of migrant in terms of international law, please. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to begin my speech by saying that the topic we are dealing with today is undoubtedly of at the most importance. The 21st century is a time of challenges and crises, including migration crisis. Europe is struggling with the influx of the illegal immigrants of, uh, of many fronts and is unable to find a solution to its problems. It's therefore important to discuss its problem scientifically in order to develop legal mechanisms that ensure security and respect human rights and freedoms. In my opinion, it's important to clarify the concept of the migrants under the international law. It's important to emphasize that the, at the international level, there is no uniform legal definition of the term migrants. Some decision makers, international organizations, and the media understand and use the word migrants as a general term of that includes both migrants and refugees. For example, global statistics on international immigration tend to use a definition of the international migration that also includes asylum seekers and refugees. In legal discourse, however, this practice can easily lead to misunderstanding and have a serious consequences for the lives of the safety of refugees and migrators. Migration is often understood as a voluntary process, such as the, when someone crosses a border in a search for the better economic opportunities. This does not apply to refugees who cannot safely return to home and they are therefore entitled to special protection under the international law. Blurring the distinction between the terms refugees and migrants diverts attention from the specific legal protection that refugees require, such as protection of, from the refoulement, 
from being penalized for the crossing the border without the permission in a search of a safety. There is nothing uh, illegal about the seeking asylum. On the contrary, it's a universal human right. Merging the term refugee and migrants can undermine public support for refugee and asylum institution at the time when the refugee don't ever need uh, such a protection. We must treat all people with their respect and dignity. We need to ensure um, migrants' respect for the human rights. At the same time, we must, uh, we must also ensure appro appropriate legal and operational responses to needs the refugee, given their particular situation, and avoid delating the responsibility of uh, states towards refugees. For this reason, United Nations always refers to refugee and migrants separately in order to ensure clarity of the causes of nature of the refugee movement and not to forget the specific obligation towards refugee under the international law. The definition adopted by the United Nations Department of the Economic Social Affairs, according to which international migrants is any person who changes his or her country, habitual residence, deserves attention. The United Nations definition excludes movement under recreation, holiday, um, visits to friends and relatives, business, medical treatment, or religious pilgrim. The department also developed a detailed definition of short-term and long-term migrants. Long-term migrants is defined as a person who moves uh, to a country or his or her usual place of the residence for a period of at least one year so that the country of destination effectively becomes his or her new country of the habitual residence. A short-term migra uh, short migrant, on the other hand, is defined uh, as a person who stays outside the country for the period of 3 to 12 months. And that's all for my side. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your explanation. And it's time to ask the speaker from Central European team to present the same topic. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen and fellow debaters. Uh, today we will engage in a thoughtful and reasoned debate on the intricate and multifaceted concept of a migrant uh, within the international national law framework. In international law, the term migrant is notably absent from a precise definition. In, instead, uh, it finds its definition in what is not. It's not a refugee. In this context, a migrant represents an individual who willingly relocates from one nation, from one country to another, typically driven by aspirations from improved economic prospects, educational pursuits, family reunification, or various personal reasons. Crucially, migrants do not flee persecution uh, or severe harm, setting them apart uh, with this from refugees. While it has become increasingly common to witness the inter interchangeability of the terms refugee and migrant in media and in public discussions, as was mentioned already, it is essential to recognize the critical legal difference between the two. On the international stage, uh, there exists no uniform legal definition on the term migrant, but we have a definition on the migrant worker uh, from the 1990 UN Convention on the Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Members of Their Families, where migrant worker is defined as an individual engaged in a remunerated re re activity in a state they are not a national. However, some policymakers, international or organization and media outlets employ the word migrant as an umbrella term that encompasses migrants and refugees altogether. For instance, the global statistics of international migration often employ, as was already mentioned, a definition of international migrant that includes many asylum seekers and re refugees within its scope. The term migration is commonly associated with a voluntary process, such as someone crossing a border in a search of improved uh, economic opportunities. Blurring the lines between refugee and migrant can detract attention from the specific legal protection that refugees require, such as fr protection from refuelment and safeguards against penalties from crossing borders without authorization in pursuit of safety. Refuelment, for clarity, refers uh, to the forcible return of refugees or asylum seekers to a country where they face persecution. This is not uh, 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 also for migrants. This uh, conflation of refugees and migrants can undermine public support for refugees and the institution of asylum, particularly when the need for such protection is greater than ever before. So do all migrants truly choose to migrate? 
it is crucial to recognize that the motivation behind human mobility and are often complex and multifaceted. People's de de decisions to move may result from a combination of factors. Migrants may cross international borders to seek better employment opportunities, or in some case in, uh, cases, education, family reunification, etc. Under international law, however, individuals who leave their home uh, countries for these reasons would not typically be considered refugees. In conclusion, as we engage in this debate on the concept of the migrant within the international and national law frame framework, it is imperative to acknowledge the legal distinctions between the these two. We must also recognize the complexity of the factors that drive people to move. By pro promoting clarity in these uh, uh, terms we uh, we can better advocate for also migrant and refugee laws. Thank you. Thank you very much for your speech. And now I, I would like to ask the next speaker from the Polish team to describe the topic clarification of the concept of migrant in terms of national law. Thank you very much. And I have to start uh, from this point that at the international level, uh, there are various legal definitions and of the term of migrant. And in Poland, um, the definition is rather filled up. It's divided into types, for example, immigration, emigration, temporary migration, permanent migration, etc. Um, and there are rather economic definitions, so one looks in vain for a normative definition. And as my colleague already said, it's um, commonly misused um, uh, if it goes about these two terms. So uh, commonly, especially in media, uh, it's um, both migrants and refugees are describing as migrant. And... Um, the, um, comp the compilation of Poland's central statistical office usually present it uh, in regard on data um, on the main direction of migration from Poland uh, and immigration to Poland uh, for permanent residents. So this uh, um, that is um, division. Uh, and these data illustrate the so-called migration flows, uh, in particular, yes, referring only to the documented facts on, uh, of migration. So, um, emigration, formally deregistration uh, de from permanent residence uh, in Poland in connection with departure abroad, and also immigration, so formally uh, reg registration for permanent res residence in Poland in connection with arrival from uh, abroad. Uh, but what does it look like procedurally in Poland? Um, well, migrants uh, intending to cross the uh, Polish borders uh, should have a valid travel documents, of course. Um, so the document authoriz authorizing them uh, to enter and stay in the territory of the Republic of, of Poland and justify the purpose of their stay. Uh, the rules for crossing the border are set um, in articles uh, of the law of foreigners. Those are art articles from uh, 23 to, 60, uh, to uh, 36. And if any of these conditions are not met, a person may be denied um, entry to, into Poland. Uh, migrants and refugees uh, differ mainly in their motives um, and circumstances for coming to the territory of another country. So it's important to not misuse these two terms, of course, as we all said. Um, due to the special situation of refugees, they are covered by international protection and assistance of the host state. And one of the basic principles, of course, the principle of non uh, refoulement which indicates that no state adhering to um, Geneva Convention will expel or turn back in any way uh, a refugee to the border of territories where his uh, um, or her life um, or freedom would be endangered because of his race, religion, nationality, uh, membership in a particular social group or political beliefs also. Um, the only exception to this rule is a security threat. Uh, so while states are able to create migration to some extent uh, by in including, for example, limits on um, the issuance of visas uh, or work permits, so it is difficult to, uh, on the other hand, to predict how many people will find themselves in a diffi difficult situation, uh, justifying the granting of international protections such as uh, refugee status, and uh, that's the main uh, differences in, uh, in Polish law. Thank you. Thank you so much for speaking. And now I would like to ask the next presenter from Central European team to describe the subject matter clarification of the concept of migrants in terms of national law. 
Thank you very much. National laws, in contrast, offer divergent definitions of migrants, often contingent on immigration statutes and visa categories. Nations establish specific criteria governing various visa types, ranging from employment visas to student visas and even family reunification visas. Their adherence to these established criteria dictates the legal status of migrants. The incorporation of refugee and migrant law into the national laws of Central European countries is influenced by a combination of domestic legislation, international treaties and European Union regulations. Like other EU member states, Central European countries have certain legal obligations stemming from international and EU law and their own national legislation, which shapes how they handle refugees and migrants. Let me present you some examples from Central Europe. Hungary has implemented various changes to its asylum and immigration policies in the recent years. The country has been criticized for its restrictive asylum policies and for effectively controlling its borders to asylum seekers through measures such as constructing fences along its borders with Serbia and Croatia. Hungary, like other EU member states, adheres to the Dublin regulation, which determines the EU member state responsible for processing asylum claims. In practice, this means that Hungary may return asylum seekers to the first EU country they entered, however, they meet to legal disputes within the EU. Hungary has also established transit zones at its border where asylum seekers may be detained while their claims are processed. The amended legislation, asylum, the amended legislation tightened asylum and immigration laws. These changes have included criminalizing assistance to undocumented migrants and imposing penalties on organizations that aid asylum seekers and refugees. When it comes to Romania, the country has made a major progress in the past years regarding its asylum and immigration policies. However, there are still significant challenges the state faces. One of the biggest concerns is the lack of a comprehensive national strategy. Without such a strategy, efforts to support refugees are often fragmented and uncoordinated. Nevertheless, in the recent years, the country has had significant efforts and implemented policies to control immigration and to ensure that asylum seekers are properly registered and screened. Furthermore, the National Agency for Refugee and Migration was established, which is responsible for managing the asylum process and provides support to refugees. The importance of agency can be seen in several key areas. First of all, the National Agency for Refugee and Migration is responsible for managing the asylum process in Romania. This includes registering asylum seekers, conducting evaluations to determine refugee status and providing support to refugees during their integration into Romanian society. The agency's role in managing the asylum process is essential for ensuring that asylum seekers receive the protection and support they need. In addition, the agency is responsible for implementing national and international legal frameworks related to refugee protection. This includes the 1951 Refugee Convention and its 1967 Protocol, as well as other national and international laws related to refugee protection. The agency's work in this area is essential for ensuring that Romania's, Romania complies with its legal obligations related to the protection of asylum seekers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your explanation. So now I would like to please next presenter from Polish team to present us next topic, review of the objectives of migration law. Thank you very much. Uh, the goal of the state's uh, migration policy is uh, coherent uh, knowledge-based uh, migration management system that ensures security and public order fostering economic development and social cohesion. Accordingly, several directions of Poland's migration policy uh, can be distinguished. First, safe, efficiently managed legal immigration to Poland adapted to the needs of the economy and changing challenges. Mm, effective prevention and combating of illegal migration. Uh, implementation of the state's repatriation obligations, uh, access to international protection while maintaining stand control over the migration phenomenon, uh, 
supporting Polish emigrants and fostering their return to Poland, uh, creation of a comprehensive system of integration and assimilation of foreigners, ensuring a security in uh, migration processes, concluding international cooperation to support the implementation of migration policy objectives, straightening uh, the institutional system in the area of migration, monitoring migration processes and diagnosing and forecasting Poland's social economic needs. Uh, in addition mm, to national policies, the International Organization for Migration was established as the, as the leading intergovernmental organization promoting orderly migration with res respect for human rights. Uh, the activities of the International Organization for Migration focus on ensuring that migration is properly managed in an orderly manner and with respect for human rights, promoting international cooperation on migration and supporting the search for practical solutions to the problem of migrants, including refugees, displaced persons and those uh, who have been forced by the situation to permanently leave their place of residence. The International Organization for Migration focuses on four areas uh, of migration management. Migration and development, facilitating migration, regulating migration and responding to forced migration. Activities that link all of these areas are the promotion of international migration law, debate on migration policies and advice, protection of migrants' rights and health and gender issues in migration processes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the speech. And the same topic will be presented by another participant from the Central European team. The floor is yours. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, today I stand before you to shed light on the intricate web of migration law, a framework that intricately waves together the interests of nations, individuals and societies. At its core, migration law encapsulates a multifaceted set of objectives, each playing a pivotal role in shaping the movement of people across borders. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, migration law upholds the principle of sovereignty and control. It grants nations the authority to govern who enters, stays, and departs from their territories, laying the foundation for active governance and ensuring the security of their citizens. In tandem with sovereignty, migration law is a guardian of national security interest. It acts as a shield preventing the entry or stay of individuals who may pose threats to the safety and well-being of nation's populace. This fundamental aspect safeguards the integrity of a nation. Migration law is not solely a matter of security. It embraces economic considerations. It delves others the ebb and flow of the labor market, regulating the entry and employment of foreign workers to harmonize supply and demand, and especially in industries with rotating workforce needs. A humanitarian trade runs through migration law, offering solace to those fleeing persecution, violence, or peril in their home countries. This compensation dimension provides mechanism for granting asylum or refugee status, extending a lifeline to those in dire need of international protection. Family reunification, another core store of migration law, acknowledges the sanctity of family bonds. It enables close kin to reunite, recognizing the importance of family unit in the migration journey, promoting social uh, integration and cohesion. Migration law champions programs that equip migrants with the tools of seasonally integrate into their whole societies. This includes language training, cultural orientation, and initiatives that foster participation in social, cultural, and economic fabric of the host nation. Human rights and dignity are not negotiable in the realm of migration law. It mandates that migrants be treated with fairness, respect, and in strict accordance with international human rights standards. Discrimination is condemned and the rights of vulnerable groups such as refugees, children and victims of trafficking are rigorously protected. Yet, migration law doesn't stop at protection. It actively combats exploitation and abuse. It stands as a bulwark against human trafficking, 
forced labor and all forms of exploitation, ensuring that those who engage in such practice are held accountable under the law. In the global arena, migration law fosters international cooperation. Through bilateral or multilateral agreements, it addresses issues ranging from border control to extradition, facilitating the admission of migrants and providing humanitarian assistance. In doing so, it strengthens bonds between nations and ensures a collaborative approach to migration challenges. Furthermore, some nations employ migration policies that seek to contribute to the development of both sending and receiving countries. These programs facilitate remittances, support temporary labor migration, and promote skills development, embodying a holistic view of migration as a force for positive change. In essence, migration law embodies a delicate balance of interest, waving together the aspiration of nation, migrants, and societies. It stands as a testament to the complex and ever-involving nature of human movement, shaping destinies and enriching nation along the way. Thank you so much for your speech. And I would like to please the next speaker from Polish team to describe the topic, analysis of rights and obligations under migration law. Thank you so much. Migration today has assumed the form of a global phenomenon. The surge in migration is largely influenced by the military conflict in Ukraine, which necessitated the establishment of distinct system for Ukrainian citizens to legalize their residence and employment in Poland. The analysis of, of rights and obligations under migration law in Poland is of paramount importance as it shapes the relationship between the state and migrants, impacting social, economic and cultural dimensions. Rights are complemented by obligations both for citizens and migrants residing in the country, including Poland. Let's begin our discussion of migrants' rights in Poland with a focus on the right of entry and residence. Foreigners crossing the border into the territory of Republic of Poland for extended stays exceeding 90 days must substantiate the purpose and conditions of their intended stay. Additionally, they are required to possess and present upon request a valid travel document, a long-term visa or resident permit issued by the Polish authorities and documentation confirming their possession of health insurance. Equally significant as are financial resources adequate to cover the expenses associated with the planned stay, return to their country of origin or residence or transit cost to a third country that allows entry. Foreigners are obligated to depart from the territory of Republic of Poland before the expiry of the authorized stay period, whether it falls under the visa-free regime or aligns with a duration specified in their visa or resident permit. Civil and political rights safeguard individual freedoms, including those of migrants, against infringements by government non-state entities and individuals. These rights ensure the ability to engage in social and political life without discri discrimination or repression. Civil rights encompass the right to life, freedom from torture and other forms of ill treatment, freedom of concessions and religion, political participation and access to information. Another crucial aspect alongside the right to free movement and the protection of human rights is the matter of employment. For a foreigner to legally engage in work based on a work permit or statement, they must possess a residence title that grants them the right to work in Poland. The foreigner applies for the residence title personality. The analysis of rights and obligations under migration law is a complex matter that takes into account the rights of foreigners as well as the interests of states. Striking a balance between these aspects is pivotal for the effective management of migration and the fostering of open and diverse societies. Thank you. Thank you so much for speaking. And now I would like to please the next speaker from Central European team to describe the subject matter analysis of rights and obligations under migration law. Thank you. Uh, international and European human rights law oblige uh, EU member states to guarantee human rights to all individuals under their jurisdiction. This applies to regular and irregular migrants as well. 
Although member states are not obliged to grant mi all migrants the same benefits as their own nationals, they must adhere to the basic set of human rights standards. This includes access to essential health care for all, including emergency and basic health care, care and education of children under the same conditions as in the case of nationals, ability to claim for justice, a mechanism that allows an individual to file a complaint and obtain redress, for example, compensation for work injury. It is a well-established international law that all people without discrimination possess rights and fundamental freedoms and that states have a prime responsibility and duty to respect, protect and fulfill those rights and freedoms. However, there are also reciprocal responsibilities and obligations of migrants toward host societies. This is an important aspect of the discussion because legal systems have give rise to both rights and responsibilities and it is generally understood that all individuals, be they nationals or non-nationals, must respect the laws and regulations of the state on whose territory they are present. Migrants are no exception to this. The general obligation to respect the laws and regulations of a state has multiple dimensions in the migration context. It is relevant not only in terms of the laws applicable to all people, including nationals, but also to those that are more specifically governed, the entry and stay of foreigners such as visa conditions, work entitlements and returns, among others. The principal contribution for governments is to ensure that people considering migrating have access to sufficient information on their rights and obligations including possible orientation training to prepare migrants for life in their new country. Together with a broader range of initiatives and practices relevant to integration and social cohesion, this could be amongst the recommendations and commitments outlined in the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration. In some countries, migrants irregularly, irregularly on their territory of a state and subject to a return decision may have the obligation to collaborate with the state authorities with a view to their return. This obligation of collaboration is not always clearly defined in national law, but it often entails that the individual should not abscond. Failing so, states normally impose further duties on the individual to secure his removal. In such cases, states should indeed favor alternatives to detention or any deprivation of liberty always has to be prescribed by law, be necessary and proportionate to the objective pursued so as not to be arbitrary and thus not be in violation of international human rights law. In addition to the general obligation to respect laws on the territorial state as any other individual's specific obligations attached to their immigration status are often incumbent upon migrants in host countries. Among these, migrants may have an obligation to register to the consent authorities and be subsequently responsible for renewing their visa permit. Depending on the latter, they might have the right to work or not, or be entitled to work under specific conditions. While all such responsibilities and obligations may be legitimate, states should also make sure they do not infringe upon migrants' human rights, especially the principle of non-discrimination and the right to due process. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. So now I would like to please presenter from Polish team to present us next topic. Clarification of the concept of refugee in terms of international law, please. Okay, turning to the second part of uh, the issue, the clarification of the concept of the refugee, it's important to point out the distinction uh, between the definition of refugee and migrants. It should be noted that the terms refugee and migrants are increasingly used as a synonyms in media and in the public discourse. There is a fundamental difference between them of a legal nature. Um, confusion between these terms can lead to a problem affecting refugee and asylum seekers as well as a confusion in the decision uh, on asylum and migration. The term refugee is clearly defined in the international law which provides protection to the refugee. Refugee are persons who are outside their country of their origin in the fear of the prosecution, conflict, violence or other circumstances seriously disturbing public order and who, as a result of the above, require international protection. They are often in such a dangerous situation that they cross national border to seek safety in neighbour countries. Thus, they are recognised internationally as refugees, persons who are 
entitled to assistance from the other states, the United Nations and the relevant organization. They are uh, recognized as a refugee precisely because it's too dangerous for them to return home and they therefore need to refugee elsewhere. There are individuals for the home denial of asylum and poten potentially fatal consequences. Uh, the specific legal regime that protects the rights of the refugee is called international refugee protection. The need for the regime uh, stems from the fact that the refugees are particularly vulnerable person in the need of the additional resources. Asylum seekers and refugees are deprived of the protection of their country. Article 30 of the Universal Declaration of the Human Rights grants every human being the right to the seek and enjoy asylum. However, the concept of asylum did not have a clarification definition of the international level until the 1951 uh, Refugee Convention was adopted uh, and the United Nations was entrusted with the overseeing the implementation. The convention and its protocol from 1967, as well as a regional uh, instruments such as, for example, the Organization of African uh, Unity Convention, governing certain aspects to refugee problem in Africa, for example, are the cornerstone of the modern refugee protection regime. They provide a universal definition of a refugee and define the basic rights and obligation of the refugee. <clears throat> the provision of the convention from 1951 uh, remained the main international standards underpinning the assessment of the protection measures and treatment of refugee. Its, more, uh, its most important provisions, the principle of a non refoulement uh, contained in Article 33 in the cornerstone of the aforementioned regime. According to this principle, refugee must not be expelled or returned to place uh, where their lives or freedom would be treated. States have primary responsibility for such a protection and the United Nations works closely with government advising and supporting at them as necessary in the implementation of their responsibilities. The convention and its protocol have uh, saved a million lives and such as are one of the key human rights instruments. The convention is a milestone humanitarian law uh, developed in the aftermath of mass movement of people, exceeding in the size even those of uh, we see today. Its core, um, the, the, uh, the convention represents uh, fundamental humanitarian values. It has uh, clearly demonstrated its capacity to adapt, uh, changing factual circumstances being recognized by the courts as a living instrument for granting protection to refugees in a changing environment. The biggest challenge regarding refugee protection is certainly not the uh, convention itself, but rather ensuring the states comply with this provision. The real need is to find more effective ways to implement this provision in the spirit of international cooperation and the responsibility sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much for your speech. And now the same topic will be presented by another participant uh, from the Central European team. The floor is yours. Thank you. Turning our attention to the concept of uh, refugee, let us examine this category with equal rigor and precision. Within the realm of international law, the cornerstone for understanding co the concept of a refugee is uh, the 1955 uh, Refugee Convention and its uh, 1967 Protocol. These two legal instruments together offer a comprehensive definition of who qualifies as a refugee. According to the 1951 Refugee uh, Convention, a refugee is defined as follows, and I quote, someone who is unable uh, or unwilling to return to their country of origin owing to a well-founded fear of being prosecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion. In essence, a refugee under this framework is an individual who has been compelled to flee their home country due to a well-founded fear of persecution, which is rooted in characteristics such as race, religion, nationality, and uh, what I already uh, encompassed. Crucially, refugees are forced to leave their homeland because they face life-threatening persecution or severe violations of their fundamental freedoms. Uh, this definition encapsulated in the 50, uh, 1951 Convention underscores that refugees are not merely individuals who choose to move from their own country to another for various reasons. Instead, refugees are compelled in this situation. So, distinguishing between refugees and migrants, it is vital to, uh, to make a distinction between these two. 
while the concept of migrant might encompass anyone who moves from their home country to another, regardless of their motivation or needs, uh, the classification of a refugee hinges on the core reason for their flight as the framework of rights and responsibilities that, uh, that uh, govern their situation. Uh, refugees are those individuals who flight uh, uh, is uh, driven by a well-founded fear, uh, as outlined earlier. This clear and specific cr criterion sets them apart from the other categories of people on the move. To exemplify, when individuals are forced to seek refuge in a neighboring country due to prosecution based on attributes su such as ethnicity and religion, uh, they epitomize the international definition of a refugee. Their situation is distinct from that of a migrant who might move for various reasons like ec economic opportunities or personal preferences. It is crucial to recognize and uphold this legal distinction to ensure that refugees uh, receive the pr protection and support they need in a world where displacement and human mobility continue to be a pressing global issue. Thank you. Thank you very much for your explanation. Um, I would like to please the next speaker from Polish team to describe the topic clarification of the concept of refugee in terms of national law. Thank you. Um, the normative concept of refugee in Poland is um, generally exhausted by the definition in Article 1A of Paragraph 2 of the Geneva Convention, um, a definition my colleague has um, already mentioned. Uh, so in accordance with um, Article 39 with Paragraph 3 of the Convention um, drawn up in Geneva, uh, the instrument of accession of um, the Republic of Poland to above convention was deposited with the Secretary General of United Nations on September 27, uh, 1991. Uh, in accordance with Article 43 with Paragraph 2 of uh, this Convention, uh, the Convention enters uh, into force with respect to the Republic of Poland on December 20, um, 26, 1991. Uh, that international background is most important here uh, when it goes about Polish uh, legal system. Uh, but among Polish national legal acts, uh, the law of foreigners should be mentioned. Uh, this law only defines the term of foreigner. So um, it defines as anyone who doesn't have Polish citizenship. So here we have a simple distinction which depends on the fact of having or uh, not having Polish citizenship. Uh, this is broad under understanding of uh, the concept of a refugee, uh, which, however, in Poland um, doesn't guarantee the enjoyment of protection for this special group of foreigners. Um, to be granted full rights, one must obtain a refugee status. Uh, it is granted by the head of the office uh, for foreigners on the basis on the act of granting protection to um, foreigners on the territory of the Republic of Poland. Uh, as mentioned earlier, um, a person who doesn't meet this condition for entry into Poland, for example due to the uh, lack of passport or uh, valid visa, uh, may declare a desire to apply for, apply for international um, protection while crossing the border. Um, then the border guard office doesn't issue a decision on refusal of uh, entry into the territory of Republic of Poland. Uh, moreover, such an application can be submitted through the commander of the uh, Polish Guard Post. Um, during the application procedure, the foreigner is entitled to accommodation in a center for foreigners, as well as medical um, and social assistance. Uh, importantly, a person in the refugee procedure, as a rule, uh, has uh, no right to work. Uh, he can start working only in a situation where the procedure lasts uh, longer than six months and he receives a special certificate. Uh, it is worth remembering that um, the, the, the mere submission of an application uh, doesn't mean that the applicant will receive such, uh, such a status. Uh, each case is, of course, individual and uh, it must be shown that uh, it is a specific person who is uh, in danger. Thank you. Thank you so much for speaking. And now I would like to please the next speaker from Central European team to describe the very same topic. Thank you very much. 
While national laws generally align with the international refugee definition, they may incorporate supplementary criteria and asylum determination procedures. Let me present you a few examples from Central Europe. The Czech Republic, for instance, defines a refugee as someone unable or unwilling to return to their homeland due to persecution or a well-founded fear of persecution based on the five protected grounds stipulated in international law. National legal instrument that defines the criteria for granting international protection in the territory of the Czech Republic is the Asylum Act. The Act assesses and decides whether the criteria are met and whether the refugee will be granted international protection in the Czech Republic. The Act also decides on the status of a stateless person. As a member of the European Union, the Czech Republic is also bound to apply the rules of the common European asylum system. In Hungary, the legal framework for refugees is primarily governed by the Act on Asylum and the Government Decree on Refugee Status and Subsidiary Protection. Hungary defines a refugee in accordance with international standards, particularly the 1951 Refugee Convention and its 1967 Protocol. According to Hungarian law, a person qualifies as a refugee if they have a well-founded fear of persecution and um, um, either in their country of origin or nationality due to reasons such as race, religion, nationality, political opinion or membership in a particular social group. The country also provides subsidiary protection to individuals who do not meet the strict refugee definition but face a real risk of serious harm such as torture, inhuman or degrading treatment or a threat to their life in their home country. The provision is contained in Article 4 uh, in the Act of Asylum. Hungarian law includes the principle of non refoulement in Article 7 in the Act of Asylum, which prohibits the expulsion, deportation or return of individuals to countries where they may face persecution or serious harm. The Act on Asylum outlines the asylum procedure in Hungary, including the application process, interviews, appeals and the rights and obligations of asylum seekers. It's important to note that Hungary has implemented restrictive asylum policies in recent years, including measures that have made it difficult for asylum seekers to enter the country and seek protection. These policies have been the subject of controversy and legal challenges. As for the Slovak Republic, the country provides international protection in accordance with its international obligations, European law and national legislation. In Slovakia, the concept of a refugee is primarily defined and clarified by the Act on Asylum. Uh, this has been amended several times in the recent years. The most recent amendment came into force on the 1st of June in 2022 and was meant to ease the integration of international protection holders as well as asylum seekers. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I would like to please the next speaker from Polish team to describe the topic review of the objectives of refugee law, please. Thank you very much. As for the goals of refugee law, uh, most countries in the world uh, have adopted general goals under the United Nations Universal System. Uh, the most enduring institution established within the United Nations is the officer of the United uh, Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, the main task of the Office of the High Commissioner uh, include providing international care for refugees who fall under the institution's mandate and taking action to seek uh, lasting solutions to the refugee problem. In practice, the High Commissioner undertakes activities aimed at first, promote the uh, conclusion and ratification of international conventions uh, on the protection of refugees, monitor their applications and amend them, uh, take action by all means to contribute to improving the situation of refugees and uh, reducing their numbers, and the second one, uh, solving ongoing problems uh, related to the emergency of refugee waves including advocating to their uh, admission to a specific territory, uh, assisting uh, in obtaining permits for the transfer of assets, 
coordinating the cooperation of all institutions and in the individual concern. Uh, High Commissioner also activities also include uh, voluntary repatriations, uh, settlement in a country of asylum, uh, and resettlement in another country when none of above options is feasible. It should be clearly emphasized that High Commissioner extends care not only of refugees uh, to the, in the strict sense of the word, but also include other group of people in need of assistance, including internally displaced person, stateless person, repatriates. Poland recognized the difficult global refugee situation and it's confronting it in solidarity with the entire international community. We are joining its efforts to provide comprehensive support to refugees in their regions of origin and in action to enable as many of them as possible to return uh, home uh, quickly and safely, as well as in supporting fair countries to effectively manage migration and build their own capacity in this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for speaking. Now I would like to please the next speaker from Central European team to describe the subject matter review of the objectives of refugee law. Thank the floor you. is yours. First and foremost, refugee law seeks to provide a haven for those fleeing persecution, conflict or and unimaginable hardships. It is a beacon of hope for those forced to abandon their homes, families and familiar surroundings due to circumstances beyond their control. By offering protection for refugees, we uphold the very essence of our shared community. Moreover, refugee law strives to ensure that asylum seekers are treated with dignity, respect and fairness. It endeavors to guarantee that their rights are preserved regardless of their nationality or legal status. This means affording them the opportunity to seek and enjoy asylum without facing discrimination or penalization. Another pivotal objective of refugee law is the principle of non refoulement This cornerstone prohibits the expulsion of or return of refugees to countries where their lives or freedoms may be in jeopardy. It stands as a safeguard against the horrors of persecution, torture, or even death, echoing our collective commitments to human rights. Furthermore, refugee law endeavors to facilitate durable solutions for displaced individuals. This includes voluntary repatriation when conditions in their home countries permit, resettlement in the third country, or the possibility of local integration in the host country. These pathways pay the way for refugees to rebuild their lives and contribute to the society that embraces them. In addition, refugee law seeks to foster international cooperation and burden sharing. It recognizes that the challenges posed by large scale displacement necessitate a collective effort. By working together, nations can pool sources, knowledge, and expertise to address the complex and evolving nature of refugee crisis. Equally vital is the objective of education and advocacy. Refugee law calls for, uh, for the dissemination of information about rights, procedures and available sources to both refugees and those tasked with their protection. This empowers refugees to assert their rights and ensure that those entrusted with their welfare are equipped to fulfill their responsibilities. In conclusion, the objectives of refugee law are intervened with our shared commitment to dignity, humanity and justice. They beg on us to rise above borders and politics and extend a helping hand to those who uh, have forced the harshest of trials. By understanding and championing these objectives, we pave the way for a more compassionate and inclusive world. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Now I would like to ask our last speakers in the first part of the debate to present their opinion in dispute. Firstly, the speaker from Polish team will to present the topic analysis of rights and obligations under refugee law. The floor is yours. Thank you. The analysis of rights and obligations uh, under refugee law is paramount when it comes to safeguarding individuals who are flying persecution and danger in their country of origin. Refugee law, both in the international and national fronts, comprises a set of regulations governing the status and rights of refugees. 
foreigners seeking refugee status in Poland, along with those covered by their application and are primarily entitled to receive social assistance and medical care. Social assistance includes, among other provisions, placement in a center for asylum seeking seekers of refugees. Additionally, foreigners have the right to apply for assistance provided out, outside the center, which includes the provision of monetary benefits to cover their expenses while residing in Poland. The head of the office is obligated to promptly inform the foreigner who has been granted refugee status or subsidiary protection in language they are understand about their rights and responsibilities. Furthermore, assistance is offered to facilitate the foreigner integration into society in accordance with the procedures and principles outlined in the law on the social assistance. Moreover, a decision to compel a foreigner to leave the territory of the Republic of Poland or expulsion order cannot be issued without revoking their refugee status or protection. This is referred to as protection from deportation. Conversely, at any point during the refugee status, proceedings uh, foreigners may request the termination of the proceedings due to their in intention to voluntarily return to their home country. A foreigner who granted refugee status receives a travel document in accordance with a Geneva Convention valid for two years and residence card valid for three years from the date of insurance. Upon the expiration of the residence card's validity, a new residence card is issued valid for the same specific period. These documents are issued following the collection of biometric data from foreigner. A foreigner who loses their refugee status is obligated to promptly return the residence card and travel document to the head of the office, but no later than within 14 days from the date when the decision became final. Individuals with refugee status or those enjoying subsidiary protection have access to an extensive range of rights, including social assistance and family benefits, health insurance, integration support, employment and entrepreneurship opportunities, equal ed educational access from primary school to higher education on pair with Polish citizens and the rights to travel abroad based on Geneva passport. Furthermore, they have the option to apply for citizenship. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now I would like to please the speaker from Central European team to present stance on the same topic. The floor is yours. Thank you. Asylum seekers and refugees, like all other individuals, can use the control mechanisms for the observers of the rights enshrined in international conventions and documents related to the protection of human rights in, and fundamental freedoms within the framework of the United Nations, the Council of Europe and the European Union. Some of the human rights conventions and documents also contain an explicit enshrining of rights related to asylum seekers or refugees or do not contain such an explicit enshrining of the rights of asylum seekers, but many of the provisions protect several of these rights indirectly. In relation to the rights of the refugees, it is necessary to mention the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. According to the general note of the Committee for Human Rights from 1986 and the Article 13, the alien must be provided with all the means to be able to exercise his remedy against expulsion and for this right to be effective in any circumstances of his case. It follows that the state authorities in such a case should take into account, account all the substantive and procedural requirements of the domestic legislation. Moreover, the person to be expelled must be allowed to present reasons against the expulsion. Asylum seekers who cannot be returned in accordance with Article 33 of the Convention therefore has to gain sufficient time to prepare these reasons, and these reasons has to be presented at the hearing. A person to be deported has the right to have his case investigated by a competent authority. For a refugee claimant, this should mean that they have the right to have their decision reviewed. The decision must be issued by a central body of a state power and administration, while the applicant should be allowed to stay in the country when the decision is being reviewed. 
The right of foreigners, according to Article 13 of the International Pact, can be limited or temporarily suspended only in cases where there are urgent reasons of national security, which include only a serious political or military threat to the entire nation. However, the truth is that the review gives space to abuse the justice system of the host country. The UN Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel and Inhuman Degrading Treatment is also applicable to relation of refugees as they are often exposed to the threat of torture, inhuman or degrading treatment. Refugees are most likely to become victims of the violation of prohibition of torture enshrined also in the European Convention on Human Rights. The European human, uh, framework of human rights therefore prohibits the deportation of a person to state where there is a threat to the person that he will be subject to torture. This, uh, my colleague mentioned, is called as the non refoulement principle. Refugees or asylum seekers may, according to the Article 22 of the Convention Against Torture, file complaint for violation of the rights enshrined in the Convention. The UN Committee Against Torture continuously deals with the several complaints of refugees. However, human rights standards of the European Union can also be used to protect the rights of asylum seekers and refugees. The European Union was originally created mainly for economic reasons, but by gradually deepening the competences of individual EU bodies, the EU agenda has also expanded to the area of human rights. The Charter of Fundamental Rights represents the summary codification of all catalogues enshrined also in the European Convention of Human Rights and Freedoms. The Charter enshrines all the most important categories of rights, such as personal, political, social, economic and cultural rights, therefore the rights of the first and second generation, but also some modern rights, such as the right of solidarity of the third generation. The Charter is an important document that contains the most extensive international bill to rights of rights up to date. The protection of the rights of asylum seekers and ref refugees is mainly enhanced in the Article 18, the right to asylum, and the Article 19, the protection in the event of removal, expulsion, or extradition of persons. However, we may find also certain indirect rights in other articles as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last speaker in the first part of our debate. Thank you once again, all our speakers. And now, do the teams have any questions for each other about the issues raised in the first panel? Okay, the Polish team have a question and uh, Central European team also. So firstly, Polish team, um, uh, feel free to, rest to ask and you have uh, one minute to answer uh, for this question. And so our question is, what changes do you think should be made to the international uh, migration and the refugee law? Okay, feel free to respond now. Uh, Central European team, are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> if you are ready, we start the uh, time because you have one minute to answer. No, okay, okay. It's okay? Yeah. So the floor is yours. Thank you. First and foremost, we must advocate for greater international cooperation and burden sharing. Immigration and displacement are a global phenomenon and no one country can bear the brand alone. Uh, it is essential that nations come together to develop shared solutions and ensure the protection and well-being of those in need, regardless of their country of origin or asylum. Um, we must bolster the protection of refugee and asylum seekers. Uh, this entails strengthening the implementation of 1951 Refugee Convention and its 1967 Protocol ensuring that the rights of refugees are upheld and that they receive fair and efficient asylum procedures. Moreover, we should explore innovative mechanisms for burden sharing, such as regional and global resettlement programs to more equitable distribution responsibilities. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And it's time to uh, your question. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, how does your country address the challenges posed by irregular migration, including smuggling and human trafficking in compliance with international law? Thank you. Okay, thank you, the Polish team. You have also one minute to answer. Uh, so, uh, all action of the Polish government and services uh, are in accordance with the national law, which is based on the international law. Uh, due to the managed migration crisis on the Polish-Belarusian border, Poland had to deal with the uncontrolled influx of illegal migrants. In accordance with the EU law and national law, Polish border guards, police and the military officials defend the tightness of the border and try to control the flow of the people. 
On the other hand, when it comes to the smuggling and trafficking in the human beings, the relevant services, the border guard, the police, the, police, the intelligence services, and the, of course, counterintelligence services, have the necessary two powers to prevent the crime. It's important to point out here the importance of these authorities in the investigation and the range of obligation that can be imposed on them to the prosecutor of the court. Furthermore, attention should be drawn to the operational and exploratory activities which strongly interfere with the citizens' rights and freedoms but are only used to necessary and in the order to protect the security of the state of the citizens. Thank you. <laughs> Great, I need thank to you do very it. much. <laughs> okay, it's okay. So, uh, this is the end of the first uh, panel. So, now I invite you to take a 15 minute break. Ladies and gentlemen, we can start the second part of the discussion. The main issue is European Union versus member state competencies in refugee and migration law limits, use and boundaries. Now let the first speaker from Central European team to describe the topic sources of migration law, national and international approach. The floor is yours. Thank you. In the context of our debate, let's explore the source, uh, sources of migration law, both on the international and national levels, shedding light on their significance in sh shaping the legal framework of international migration. I will also touch upon briefly on the Hungarian perspective. So, um, when we talk about the universal level, international migration law draws upon a vast array, array of uh, instruments and agreements that span various branches of the international law. So, uh, here also, we also talked about refugee conven the Refugee Convention in 1951 and its protocol from uh, 1967. Uh, and this establishes the criteria of ref refugee status, emphasizing uh, protection for those facing persecution. Uh, the International Convention on the Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Members of Their Families from 1990. Uh, this treaty uh, underscores the rights of migrant workers and their families, emphasizing their well-being. Uh, also, we can talk about here f about the sm uh, smuggling protocol and the trafficking protocol. These are from two, uh, both 2000 and these are addressing issues of migrant smuggling and human uh, tra trafficking. And uh, these protocols supplement the United Nations Convention Against uh, Transnational uh, Organized Crime. So when we talk about human uh, rights treaties, we have to uh, uh, talk about notable human rights treaties like ICC, PR and ICECCR. The, these contain provisions that protect the fundamental rights of migrants. Uh, International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms uh, of Racial discrimi Discrimination from 1965 and the Convention of the Rights of the Child from 1989 is also important. These treaties address issues like discrimination, family reunification and safeguarding refugee children. And also uh, the GATS mode 4 is important that pertains to the movement of people to supply services, including labor migra migration provisions. Uh, apart from specific migration treaties, numerous other, other mu multilateral agreements uh, indirectly influence migration. These in, uh, encompass areas such as international transportation, extradition, child adoption and child abduction. There are bi bilateral treaties that tra traditionally regulate the movement of individu individuals between two countries. These treaties encompass diverse aspects of migration, including labor mo mobility, visa agreements and extradition. So, uh, talking about the Hungarian perspective uh, a little bit, I want to uh, emphasize that, like many other uh, nations, Hungary has its own set of national sources of migration law. These domestic legal instruments include national legislation, constitutional provisions, administrative uh, regulations and guidelines, immigration policies, bilateral agreements, the, uh, the roles of immigration authorities, local ordinances and national human rights laws, all and uh, these all contribute to Hungary's unique legal framework governing immigration processes. 
To highlight some, I just want to uh, pinpoint the national legislation where we can find uh, 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 the legislation addressing immigration matters, including the Hungarian Act on Asylum from 2007 and the Hungarian Act on Immigration and Asylum from uh, 2016. Also, we have cons uh, constitutional provisions where the constitution uh, uh, talks about nationality, citizenship and the rights of Hungarian citizens. Uh, I want to highlight also the roles of immigration authorities. Hungary has specific gov uh, government agencies responsible for immigration matters. Uh, the National uh, Di Directorate General for Aliens po Policy and the uh, Office on, on Immigration and Nationality oversee immigration and asylum processes, including the handling of applica applicants, enforcement of immigration laws and border uh, management. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's time to ask the speaker from Polish team to present the same topic. The floor is yours. Okay. Mm, to begin with uh, mm, this, it's important to point out the three levels of the protection under the immigration law, international, regional and national. And regarding to the international level, the following legal act should be pointed out. Geneva Convention relating to the status of refugee, New York Protocol relating to the status of refugee, European Agreement on the Abolition of Visas for Refugees Done at Strasbourg, European Agreement on Transfer of the Responsibility for Refugees Done at Strasbourg, uh, Protocol Number 7 of the um, Convention of the Protection of the Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms Done at Strasbourg, Convention of the Rights of the Child, adopted by the United Nations General Assembly. And uh, this is kind of regulatory core, a prototype uh, for the regional and national systems. And moving to the uh, regional level, it's necessary to point out the legislation applicable to the European Union countries due to Poland membership in this organization. And in this section, I will not point the further legal acts. There are many of them. I will only indicate the areas uh, to which they apply. So the asylum, trafficking and human beings, border and visa, irregular migration and return, legal migration, free movement of the persons and equality. It should be mentioned that the EU um, regulation and directives are the part of the Polish legal order. Um, consequently, some of the national provisions of the EU law express the EU norms. Uh, national legal acts that constitute the sources of migration law, uh, law include, um, firstly, the Constitution of the Republic of Poland, and, uh, and there are other acts, and I, I will list them. Uh, the Act of the Foreigners, the Act of the Granting Protection to Foreigners within the territory of the Republic of Poland, the Act to the into the residence and uh, exit from the territory of the Republic of Poland national of the uh, European Union member states and their family members, the Act of the Card of the Pole, the Act on the Reparation, the Act of the Polish Citizenship, Act of the Legalizing the Stay of the Certain Foreigners in the Territory of the Republic of Poland, the Act of the Acquisition uh, of Real Estate by Foreigners, the Act of the Employment Promotion in the Labour Market Institution, the Act of the Principles of the Recognition of the prof Professional Qualifications Acquired in the Member State of the EU uh, Countries, the Act of the Law and Entrepreneurs, the Act of the Effects Delating War for the Foreigners Staying in the Territory of Republic of Poland in Violation of the Law, the Act of the Positing Workers in the Framework of the Provisions of Services, and Act of the Education System, and the uh, Act of the Higher Education and Science, Act of the Healthcare Services Financed from the Public Funds, the Act of the Social Welfare, the Act of the Support of the Family and the Foster Care System, Act of the Border Guard, uh, and Act of the Implementing Certain Provisions of the European Union Equal Treatment. And it's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your explanation. I would like to ask the next speaker from the Central European team to describe the topic Review of European Union Competences in Migration Law. Thank you. Migration law falls under shared competence between the EU and its member states. This means that both the EU and individual member states have the authority to legislate and implement migration policies, but the EU has developed a common framework to ensure coordination and harmonization. Key areas of shared competence include, first of all, border control. The EU, through its agency Frontex, coordinates border control measures to ensure the effective management of external borders. An example of shared competence regarding border control could be the following. Based on a request from Romanian authorities in March 2022, 
Frontex decided to send additional support to Romania in its efforts to help the Ukrainian population fleeing the violence in their home country. Frontex officers, including border control officers and document experts, assisted Romanian authorities in processing the massive numbers of people crossing the border from Ukraine and performed other border control related tasks. I'd like to mention another shared competence, which is asylum policy. The common European asylum system was established by the European Union in 1999 under the Amsterdam Treaty to ensure that asylum seekers and refugees are treated fairly and consistently across Europe. The system includes directives on asylum procedures, reception conditions and qualification for inter international protection. Member states must align their national laws within these EU directives. And the last shared competence is visa policy. The EU has a common visa policy and it issues Schengen visas that allow travel within the Schengen area without internal border checks. The Schengen rules are implemented by participating member states and the EU oversees their adherence to Schengen standards. In certain areas, the EU holds exclusive competence, meaning that only the EU institutions have the authority to legislate and make decisions. Notable examples in migration law include, first of all, external border control. While border control is a shared competence, the EU has exclusive competence over certain aspects of external border management, such as visa, visa issuance and establishing common rules for border checks. Another uh, exclusive uh, competence is legal migration. The EU has established directives governing the admission of highly qualified workers, students and researchers. It also sets rules for family reunification and long-term residence for third country nationals. And the last exclusive competence is refugee status. The EU has developed a common European asylum system under the Amsterdam Treaty that includes rules for determining refugee status and subsidiary protection. Member states are bound by EU law when making asylum decisions. In summary, the EU's competences in migration law are well established and have evolved over time to address the challenges and complexities of migration within the Union. While member states retain some, some autonomy in certain aspects of migration policy, the EU provides a common framework and standards to ensure cooperation, harmonization and respect for fundamental rights in the field of migration. Thank you. Thank you so much for your speech. And now I would like to ask the next speaker from Polish team to describe the same subject. Thank you very much. There was uh, said a lot. Uh, thank you. I agree with uh, all of uh, these uh, statements and I would like to add something more. It is worth mentioning here the global approach to migration and mobility. It's GAMM. Uh, G -M -M. Uh, this is a concept that establishes a framework for um, external uh, dimension of European Union's migration and asylum policy in accordance with which EUA cooperation uh, with third countries uh, on the aforementioned issues is uh, carried out. Uh, the GM, uh, GIMM is uh, composed of four pillars that define priority areas for dialogue and cooperation with uh, key third countries from the point of view of uh, migration. Uh, the thematic areas of GIMM are uh, firstly uh, legal migration and mobility, irregular migration and anti-trafficking, firstly um, promoting international protection and expanding the external dimension of European Union uh, asylum policy. And finally, the um, uh, interplay of uh, migration uh, and the development policies. Um, GM, GAMM activities uh, combine cooperation at the political level uh, with a practical dimension. Um, it discovers all um, external political processes and bilateral dialogues uh, in the area of migration. Uh, this includes uh, key processes and the dialogues relating to migration issues from Poland's point of view and directed eastward, such as the uh, Eastern Partnership and the Prague process. Uh, the basic instruments of practical cooperation within the GAMM uh, is the Mobility Partnership. Poland is a party um, to all partnerships um, concluded with the Eastern Partnership countries, as well as the partnership with uh, Tunisia and Jordan. Uh, 
uh, also an important tool for European Union competences uh, in the area of migration law is the European Migration Network, uh, which was established by the Council decision uh, of uh, 2008. Uh, its main objective is to meet the needs of the union's institutions and authorities and institutions of the uh, member states uh, for up-to-date objectives, reliable and comparable information on the migration and asylum. Um, the information is in, intended to provide a starting point from, for politicians and policy-making experts at the national and European level uh, to better understand the current challenges in the field of migration, including in particular um, to assist the European Commission in deciding whether further action is needed uh, at the European level. Uh, the information disseminated by the European Migration Network is also intended to contribute to raising the knowledge um, of the general public uh, about migration and asylum phenomena. The national contact point of the European Migration Network in Poland is, uh, as a curiosity, located in the Ministry of Interior. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. So now I would like to ask presenter from Central European team to present as next topic, review of member states' competences in the field of migration law. Thank you. In our discourse today, we embark on critical examination of member states' competences in migration law. This intricate landscape defines the powers and responsibilities individual nations retain within their borders concerning immigration, emigration, and related affairs. At the heart of member states' competences lies the foundational principle of national sovereignty. This principle grants each state primary authority over its territory and population, including the right to decide who may enter or exit its borders. It forms the bedrock upon which immigration policy are built. Border control stands as one of the most pivotal aspects within member states' competences. This involves the implementation of security measures, customs protocols and entry checks, ensuring the integrity of nations' external borders. Here, member states hold the reins in safeguarding their, their, their territorial boundaries. Additionally, asylum procedures remain firmly with the domain of member states. This includes the assessment of asylum application and the determination of refugee status. Each nation establishes asylum agency or authority tasked with meticulously processing these critical claims. Integral to this is the authority to define who qualifies as a refugee, a responsibility firmly retained by individual member states. They ensure the asylum seekers receive fair and individualized assessment aligning with international standards. Reception conditions for asylum seekers also fall under member states' purview. This encompasses the provision of accommodation, sustenance, healthcare, and other vital services with claims are under scrutiny. Member states are thus instrumental in ensuring human treatment during this critical period. Furthermore, international policies for those granted protection are crafted and implemented by member states. These policies, including language and vocational training, access to education and social services reflect the unique approach each nation takes in fostering the inclusion and well-being of refugees. In parallel, member states are entrusted with the authority to establish their national visa policies, providing an additional layer of control over immigration. They issue visa and residence permits according to their specific rules and guidelines. Member states also with significant influence in area of labor migration. They decide the criteria and quotes for work visas and residence permits are crucial expense in managing their re respective labor markets. Within their territories, member states are responsible for maintaining law and order, including the investigation and prosecution of immigration-related offenses. This ensures public safety and security, upholding the rights and well-being of both citizens and migrants. In the pursuit of national interest, Member states have the autonomy to enact and enforce legislation that complements EU directives and regulations. This includes addressing specific application of migration law, tailoring them to their unique circumstances. Moreover, the dynamic nature of migration law demands constant adaptation and innovation. Member states play a central role in shaping policy that respond to evolving challenges, whether they pertain to global migration trends, security concerns or humanitarian crisis. In closing, 
While member states' competences in immigration law are unequal, they operate within the framework of EU policies and regulation. The delicate balance of sovereignty and cooperation undercores the complexity of this field. As we navigate the, this dynamic landscape, we must recognize the pivotal role each member state plays in shaping their own migration policies while contributing to the collective tapestry of European migration law. Thank you. Thank you very much for speaking. The same topic will be presented by another pre participant from the Polish team. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, the primary goal of the European Union is to pursue a forward-looking and comprehensive European immigration policy based on solidarity. Immigration policies serve uh, to ensure a balanced approach to both legal and illegal immigration. Uh, the legal basis for such measures is Article 79 and 80 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. Several powers of uh, the member states can be thus be distinguished. First, legal immigration. The EU has the authority to set the conditions for the entry of third country nationals and their legal stay in member states, including uh, for the purpose of family reunification. Member states retain the right to determine the volume of uh, info, inflow uh, into their territory of third country national seeking work. Second, integration. The EU can create incentives and provide support for measures taken by member states to promote the integration of third country nationals uh, residing legally on their territory. However, EU law uh, does not provide for harmonization of national law and regulations. At the last, um, combating uh, illegal immigration. The European Union is committed to preventing and reducing illegal immigration, in particular through effective return policies, while respecting fundamental rights. Uh, the above mentioned powers uh, serve specific purposes. This, uh, these primary include defining a balanced approach to immigration. Uh, the EU aims to define a balanced approach to uh, maintaining legal immigration and combating uh, illegal immigration. Uh, proper management uh, of migration flows involve ensuring uh, fair treatment of third country nationals, uh, legally residing in member states, uh, improving measures to combat illegal immigration, uh, including human trafficking and uh, migrant smuggling, and promoting closer cooperation with third countries in all areas. The EU goal is to create a uniform level of rights and obligation for legal immigrants uh, comparable of those provided for EU citizens. And the second one, a principle of solidarity. According to the uh, Lisbon Treaty, immigration policy should be subject to the principle of solidarity and a fair sharing of res responsibilities among member states, uh, including on the financial level, according to Article 80, Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. I would like now to please the next speaker from Central European team to describe the topic limit, principle of conferral, and use, principle of subsidiarity and principle of proportionality of EU and member state competencies in migration law. The floor is yours. Thank you. At the beginning of the European integration, neither asylum nor migration policy figured as one of the common or coordinated policies. At the time of the creation of the European Community, they were fully within the competence of the national states. Along with the development of internal market and the expansion of the Schengen area, the need for integration in the area of migration policy has also developed. Asylum and immigration policy were addressed at the level of intergovernmental and later community cooperation. The principle of conferral, also known as the limitation principle, specifies that the EU has only those competencies that are conferred upon it by its member states through the EU treaties. 
in other words, the EU does not have inherent or sovereign powers, but derives its authority from member states. The EU's competences in migration law are limited to those areas explicitly outlined in the EU treaties. Member states retain their sovereignty and authority in all other areas of migration law. The principle of conferral is relevant in migration law in areas where the EU has explicit, explicit competence, such as border control, asylum policy, and certain aspects of legal migration. In these areas, the EU has the legal authority to legislate and set common rules. The principle of subsidiarity states that decisions should be made at the lowest level of government that can effectively address an issue. In the EU context, this means that the EU should not only act when the objectives of an action cannot be sufficiently achieved by member states at the national, regional or local level. The principle is applied to determine whether an issue or policy area should be addressed at the EU level or left to the discretion of the member states. Migration issues that can be effectively managed by individual member states are typically handled at that level, while EU intervention is reserved for matters that require a coordinated cross-border approach. Some aspects of migration, such as family, reunification, or the integration of migrants are often considered matters of national or local concern and are left to the discretion of member states. On the other hand, issues like external border, border control and asylum policies often evolve a transnational dimension and are addressed at the EU level. The principle of proportionality stipulates that any action taken by the EU must be proportionate to the objective it seeks to achieve. It ensures that EU actions do not go beyond what is necessary to attend the intended goals. The principle of proportionality requires that EU legislation and policies in migration law are not overly intrusive or burdensome. The EU must strike a balance between achieving common objectives and respecting the autonomy and interest of its member states. When the EU legislates on migration issues, it must is ensure that its rules and regulations are proportionate to the goals, for instance, harmonizing asylum procedures across member states. The EU cannot adopt measures that are excessively prescriptive or that infringe upon the fundamental rights of migrants or the sovereignty of its member states. In summary, these principles play a critical role in shaping the distribution and use of competencies in migration law within the EU. The principle of conferral defines the limits of the EU competencies, the principle of subsidiarity determines the appropriate level of governance, and the principle of proportionality guides the EU in crafting measures that are balanced and necessary to achieve common objectives while respecting member states' autonomy. These principles help to maintain a delicate balance between centralized EU authority and the sovereignty of individual member states in the complex field of the migration law. Thank you. Thank you so much for your ex explanation. Now I would like to ask the next speaker from the Polish team to describe the same topic. Thank you so much. Migration issues are a crucial aspect of both EU and member state policy. It's necessary to analyze the boundaries and rules governing the exercise of competences in the European Union migration and refugee law. Let's <clears throat> us delve into these principles and their significance in the realm of migration law. The cornerstone of EU competence lies in the principle of attribution. This is because the origin of the EU competences lies in those delegated by sovereign states. The EU does not pose its competences as a consequence of its status as an international organization. Rather, it holds competences bestowed upon the through anonymous decisions of its member states. This is especially articulated in EU primary law. Article 5 of the Treaty of European Union underscores the limits of EU competence by the principle of conferral. According to this principle, is the EU acts solely within the confines of competences granted into by EU member states and EU primary law to achieve the objective outlined therein. In the domain of migration law, this implies that the EU should intervene in when member states are not unable to independently manage in the flow of migrants and migration within their priorities. In response to migra migration crisis, the EU can develop a unified approach to border management and the recipient of migrants if national efforts prove influence. 
The principle of subsidiary applies solely in areas outside the exclusive competence of the EU. Decisions regarding the issuance of visas or work permits for migrants can be made by member states as they hinge on the specific requirements and conditions of each nation. The principle of proportionality dictates the EU action must be suitable and commensurate with the issue or objective under consideration. In the context of migration law, this means that the EU must refrain from introducing overly restrictive legislation or inferring upon human rights in its pursuit of migration management. In the event that the EU enforces measures to enhance border controls, they must proportionate to the actual threat and must not violate migrants' rights to seek asylum or uphold their dignity. Article 79 of Treaty and the Functioning of the European Union empowers the EU to establish an unfiled immigration policy aimed at ensuring effective management of migration flows, a credible treatment of illegal residing 30 country nationals within the EU, and the prevention of illegal immigration and human trafficking. The delineation and utilization of competences within the EU and member states in the field of migration law are rooted in the principle of conferral, subsidiary and proportionality. The principles we have discussed manifest themselves in the form of a specific norms within the domestic and international law. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. So now I would like to ask a presenter from Central European team to present us next topic, sources of refugee law, national and international approach. Thank you. Uh, in our debate regarding the sources of refugee law, it's crucial to explore its legal framework, taking into account both international and national uh, aspects. So let's delve into these sources. Again, I, I'm talking about uh, the 1951 uh, Refugee Convention and its uh, 1967 protocol. The, it's the cornerstone of international refugee law. Uh, the 1951 Refugee Convention defines who qualifies as a refugee and outlines their rights and responsibilities of uh, host countries. And the protocol ex expanded uh, its applicability, making it an universal uh, instrument. The Organization of uh, African Unity Convention, uh, this regional treaty uh, is now uh, under the African Union, it extends additional protections of, and solutions for refugees in Africa, uh, considering the unique challenges faced on the continent. Uh, the Cartagena Declaration of Refugees from 1984, uh, this is not legally binding treaty, but this declaration issued by several uh, Latin American states broadened the definition of refugees uh, to include those fleeing generalized violence, foreign aggression, internal conflicts, and massive human rights violations also. The statute of the UN High Commissioner of Refugees also defines the mandate, functions, and responsi responsibilities uh, of the UNHCR, and this is the primary inter international agency responsible for refugee protection. Also, various international human rights treaties, such as the International Covenant uh, on Civil and Political Rights and the Convention Against Torture, contain pre uh, provisions uh, relevant to refugee and asylum seeker protections. Uh, refugee issues may, may intersect with international humanitarian law also, particularly during armed uh, conflicts, the Geneva Conventions and their additional protocols provide safeguards uh, for civilians, including refugees, in such situations. Uh, moving on, the UN General Assembly has passed also resolutions over, ta over time addressing refugee, refugee protection, uh, rights and humanitarian assistance contributing to the development and interpretation of refugee law. The decisions from inter international courts and tribunals, such as the International Court of Justice, also play uh, a, a very uh, important uh, place uh, in the regional human rights uh, issues also uh, with refugee law. Uh, I want to talk about a little bit also about the Hungarian legislation and the national sources of refugee law. So Hungary's national sources of refugee law uh, align with the domestic legal framework while, while ensuring compliance with the international obligations. Uh, 
uh, here we also have to uh, emphasize on the nat national legislation, the Hungarian Act on As uh, Asylum from 2007 and the Hungarian Act on Immigration and Asylum from 2016. And uh, also I just want to pinpoint some very important uh, things uh, related to Hungary, like the labor and employment laws uh, that ensure the, uh, that refugees can access employment opportunities and integrate economically while adhering to Hungarian labor laws. Also, some educational laws addressing access to education for refugee children in line with the Hung Hungary's uh, education policies and also social services and welfare laws. These uh, provide welfare uh, for refugees in Hungary and uh, these are uh, consistent with national provisions. So it is crucial to emphasize that Hungary's national uh, sources of refugee law are designed to ensure that the country complies with the international legal obligations while addressing specific needs of refugees within Hungary's borders. This alignment between national and international law is pivotal in safeguarding the rights and well-beings uh, of refugees within Hungary's legal framework. Thank you. Thank you very much for your voice. The same topic will be presented by another participant from the Polish team. Thank you. Um, so turning to the notion of the sources of the refugee law, I could list the act presented in the first part of my speech, because just uh, the notion of the migrants of the refugee is blurring, so is refugee immigration law. However, this would be pointless. Therefore, I would like to mention the assumption of the EU migration policy, which are a consequence of the legal act that we have uh, that have not been mentioned. Since the culmination of the migration uh, crisis in 2015, the EU has been trying to implement measures to effectively control external borders and the influx of the migrants. It's important to point out that the, despite many efforts, it has failed to achieve its goals. The EU border are still not secure. Admittedly, the EU and uh, its members are intensifying the effort to develop an, eff an effective human and secure European migration policy. The European Council plays an important role in this effort by setting the strategic priorities. However, the burden of the border protection lies with the member state, as we are witnessing in Poland. The Council uh, of the EU clarifies the modus operandi and gives a mandate for the negotiation with the countries with the third countries. It also adopts legislation and defines specific programs. In October 2015, the Luxembourg Presidency launched the IPCR mechanism. There are concrete tools to help coordinate the political response to a crisis by mobilizing key actors. 8 June 2000, uh, 2023, the Council reached an agreement on two important draft regulations on asylum and immigration. First, the Asylum Procedure Regulation. Secondly, the Asylum and the Migration Management Regulation. The Asylum uh, Procedure Regulation established an EU-wide common procedure that member states would apply to applicants for international protection. The Asylum and Migration Management Regulation, if agreed, should replace the current uh, Dublin Regulation. The Dublin rules uh, indicate which member state is responsible for processing on asylum application. The new regulation will simplify these rules and shorten the deadlines. The EU is also proposing to properly balance the current system in which a few member states are responsible for the vast majority of asylum application. This is um, so-called the new solidarity mechanism, supposedly simple, predictable and practical. New rules uh, combine compulsory solidarity with flexibility for the member states on the type of individual contribution. There is no reference to voluntary solidarity, but uh, only compulsory solidarity. The common uh, European Union system provides for the minimum standards for the treatment of the all asylum seekers and the uh, processing uh, of asylum application across the EU. The migration crisis has demonstrated that EU asylum rules need to reform. However, it seems that the solution proposed by the EU will not work in the practice. The issue of regulating migration and the border protection should be the exclusive domain of the member state. Because, as the immigration crisis has shown, it's the member state that they're the best place to deal with the, such a situation. It should be pointed out that the EU proposed a major reform of the EU migration and asylum rules on 23rd uh, September 2020. The European Commission proposed a new pact on migration and asylum. This pact provides for a comprehensive common European framework for managing migration and asylum, including the several legislative proposals. 
At first glance, the EU legislative action should be questioned. It is the creation of the new provision. And to sum up, migration crisis is a fundamental issue for Europe and our civilization. We need to defend our borders according to the international law. EU migration policy is wrong. It provides to destroy our culture and our independence and sovereignty. We should uh, do the same thing like the Australia a few years ago. We need to board our, we need to uh, defend our border. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I would like to please the next speaker from Central European team to describe the topic, which is review of European <coughs> Union competences in refugee law. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to note that the European Union possesses competences in refugee law as outlined in the EU treaties and legal instruments. These competences reflect the shared responsibility between the EU and its member states in addressing refugee-related matters, and I would like to present you a brief um, review of EU competences uh, in refugee law. First of all, the EU has established a common European asylum system that harmonizes asylum policies and procedures across member states. This includes directives on asylum procedures, qualification for international protection and uh, reception conditions for asylum seekers. Furthermore, the EU adheres to the definition of a refugee as outlined in the 1951 Refugee Convention and its protocol. It ensures that member states apply a uniform standard for determining who qualifies as a refugee. Moreover, the EU has a legal framework that prohibits the refoulement, so the return, of individuals to countries where their life or freedom would be at risk, consistent with the principle of non-refoulement under international refugee law. In addition, the EU may adopt measures related to the resettlement and relocation of refugees among member states, particularly during times of significant refugee arrivals or crisis. Furthermore, the EU sets common standards for the reception conditions of asylum seekers, ensuring that they are treated in a humane and dignified manner. Moreover, the EU's Dublin regulation establishes criteria and mechanisms for determining which member state is responsible for examining an asylum application. It aims to prevent multiple applications by the same person in, in different member states. I would like to present the course of the procedure through a very brief Croatian example. The fact that an application for recognition is submitted in Croatia does not necessarily mean that the asylum procedure will be carried out in Croatia. Specifically, because under the Dublin regulations, where certain legal prerequisites apply, another state that is a party to the regulations may also be responsible for examining the application for asylum. The responsibility for examining the application may be transferred from Croatia to another state under the following conditions. In case the members of a family have been separated by fleeing and they apply for asylum in different European states, family reunification may take place and the family members' applications for asylum will be examined together. In addition, if the asylum procedure of a close family member is already in progress in a specific state or the family member legally resides or has been granted refugee status in such a state, the responsibility of the state may be established. Besides, the EU has directives that harmonize asylum procedures, ensuring common standards for the processing of asylum claims, including the right to a fair and efficient asylum procedure. At last but not least, the EU is committed to upholding human rights and fundamental rights, including those of refugees and asylum seekers, as enshrined in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. While the EU has competences in these areas, it's essential to note that member states still retain significant responsibilities and roles in the implementation of refugee law within their territories. The division of competencies between the EU and its member states is a complex process, and I believe that between these entities, it's vital to effectively address refugee-related challenges in the EU. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And now I would like to invite the next speaker from Polish team to describe the same subject. 
thank you. Um, I can say I will continue <laughs> after you. So, any person think uh, persecution or at the risk of suffering uh, serious harm in their home country has the right uh, to seek international protection, of course. Uh, asylum is one of the fundamental rights and uh, granting it to those who meet the criteria of uh, the Geneva Convention uh, is an international obligation of state parties among which are European Union member states. Uh, European, asylum, uh, European Union asylum policy is currently one of the most rapidly developing areas uh, of the uh, area of freedom, security and justice. Uh, one of its pillars is the common European asylum system. Uh, the goal of the first phase of that system um, construction was to harmonize the legal framework in place uh, in member states in the field of asylum on the basis of common minimum standards. Uh, the goal of the second stage was to create a common asylum procedure and a uniform protection status. Proposals for new acts were complemented by initiatives of um, unpractical cooperation, solidarity and the external dimension of um, asylum and migration. Uh, the reform of the common European asylum system was announced in uh, May uh, in, uh, 2015 in the European Commission um, communication entitled European Mi Migration Agenda. On May 4th and uh, July 13, um, 2016, uh, the Commission presented a package of proposals for reforming uh, legislative acts. Uh, the right to asylum is guaranteed under Article 18 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. Uh, Article 19 prohibits collective compu um, uh, compulsions and protects any person from removal, expulsion or extradition to a country, country where there is a serious risk that uh, he or she um, may be subjected to um, death penalty, torture or other inhuman or degrading treatment or punishments. Uh, UI member states have agreed uh, on a common European asylum policy, which also includes subsidiarity and temporary protection. Asylum procedures must be fair and efficient through the Union. Uh, this is the basis of the common European asylum uh, system and um, it uh, consists of a number of uh, pieces of legislation covering all aspects of the asylum pro uh, process, uh, like the Dublin reg regulation uh, previously mentioned, uh, like asylum procedures directives, uh, they are setting common standards for fair and efficient asylum procedures. Um, another one, the reception conditions directive, which sets out minimum common standards for the living conditions of asylum seekers and guarantees their access to housing, food, uh, employment and healthcare. And finally, uh, last but not least, the qualification directive which defines who is considered as a refugee or a beneficiary of subsidiary assistance and provides a number of rights for uh, beneficiaries uh, like residence permits, access to employment and education, all uh, or social welfare system and healthcare as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. I would like to ask the next speaker from Central European team to describe the topic review of member states competence in the field of refugee law. Thank you. Today we delve into critical examination of member states competences in the field of refugee law, a domain that shapes the response to one of the most pressing global challenges of our time. These competences delineate the powers and responsibility of individual nations within their border concerning the protection and support of those seeking refugee from persecution and violence. Central to member states' competences in refugee law is the bedrock principle of national sovereignty. This principle endows each state with primary authority over its territory and population, including the prerogative to decide who may seek asylum within its borders. It is upon this fu uh, foundational cornerstone that asylum policies are constructed. According to these competences, it is determination of who qualifies as a refugee, a responsibility firmly retained by the individual member states. This entails the careful assessment of asylum application and the granting of refugee status to those who meet the criteria set forth in international conventions. Furthermore, the crucial aspect of asylum procedures firmly falls under the domain of member states. 
they are tasked with the establishment of asylum agency or authorities charged with meticulously processing their claims. This process demands both to rogueness and compassion, for it holds the key to safeguarding lives and ensuring that those fleeing prosecution find the protection they so desperately seek. Reception conditions for asylum seekers uh, also rest firmly within the pure view of member states. This encompasses the provision of safe and dignified accommodation, sustenance, health care and other vital service while claims are under scrutiny. Here, member states play an instrumental role in upholding the dignity and well-being of those in their care. In tandem with this, international policies for those granted protection are crafted and implemented by member states. These policies, which include language, invocational training, access to education and social service, reflect the unique approach each nation takes in fostering the inclusion and well-being of refugees. It is through this policy that member states create pathways for refugees to build their lives and contribute meaningfully to their new communities. Member states also wield significant influence in the area of temporary protection. They may establish mechanisms to respond to mass influxes of displaced persons, exemplifying their readiness to provide coordinated and humanitarian response during time of crisis. In, time, in times of peril, member states are entrusted with the authority to establish and implement humanitarian admission and resettlement programs. This reflects their commitment to offering refugee to those in desperate need, upholding the noble tradition of human solidarity. Moreover, member states are vital players in external relations and negotiations with third countries on issues related to refugee protection. They engage in dialogues on admission agreements and cooperate on addressing the root causes of forced displacement. These efforts exemplify their dedication to a comprehensive and sustainable solution to the complex challenges posed by displacement. In closing, the competence of member states in the field of refugee law is a reflection of their unwavering commitment to the values of compassion, solidarity and human dignity. As we navigate this intricate landscape, we must acknowledge the pivotal role each member state plays in shaping policies that offer refugee, hope and a new beginning uh, to those in, is in search for safety. Thank you. Thank you so much for your explanation. And now I would like to invite the next speaker from Polish team to describe the same topic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the EU asylum policy aims to grant appropriate status to any citizen of the non-member state uh, in need of international protection in a member state to ensure compliance with the principle of non refoulement Accordingly, the Union seeks to introduce a common European asylum system. The European Union uh, aims to develop a common policy of asylum, subsidiary protection and temporary protection. This will ensure that every citizen in need of international protection is granted appropriate status and that the principle of non refoulement is respected. Since the culmination of the migration crisis in 2015, the EU has been implementing measures to more effectively control uh, external borders and the influx of migrants. The EU and its member states are stepping up efforts to develop an effective, human and secure European migration policy. The European Council plays an important role in these efforts as it sets strategic priorities. On the basis of this, the EU Council specifies ways to act and give a mandate for negotiations with third countries. It also adopts law and determines specific programs. In recent years, the EU Council and the European Council have developed a strong response to migration pressures. To properly balance the current system in which a few member states are, are responsible for vast majority of asylum applications, a new solidarity mechanism is proposed. Simple, predictable and practical. The new rules combine mandatory solidarity with flexibility for member states on the type of individual contributions. 
In the wake of Russia's aggression against Ukraine on March, uh, March 4, 2022, the EU decided to introduce a system of temporary protection to reduce the pressure of national asylum system and allow displaced people to enjoy harmonized uh, rights across the EU. These rights include right of residence, access to the labour market and housing, medical assistance, children access to education. As of January 2023, 4 million Ukraine refugees have uh, benefited from temporary protection in the EU. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. And now I would like to ask our last speakers in the second part of debate to present their position oh. in dispute. <coughs> Firstly, the speaker from uh, Central European team uh, will to present the topic limit, principle of conferral and use, principle of subsidiarity and principle of proportionality of EU and member state competencies in refugee law. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, asylum policy is considered a matter of common interest at the level of the European Union. Since the creation of the European community, it has undergone significant development and today this policy is coordinated at the transnational level by the EU institutions. It is important that the EU does not go beyond the scope of competencies transferred to it by the member states. And that at the same time, when protecting rights, it pays attention to the international obligations of the member states and draws constitutional traditions as referred to in the pre preamble of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. However, the EU's authority in this area was expanded many times. For example, by the adoption of the Long-Term Resident Directive and the Family Reunification Directive, which concerns family members of guarantors who are nationals of third countries, in the sense of family members in the EU who applies for family reunification. According to the EU law, any form of removal under the return directive or transfer of an individual to another member state under the Dublin regulation must as such comply with the right to asylum and the principle of non refoulement The principle of non refoulement and its interpretation is affecting the European Union and their asylum law. The analysis done by the European Court of Human Rights in its jurisprudence undoubtedly has had an impact on the application of the Dublin regulation. It can be stated that the European Court of Human Rights, in the case of MSS against Belgium and Greece, partially abolished the system of division of competences created by the Dublin Regulation. The Court concluded that Belgium violated Article 3 and Article 13 of the Convention by returning the applicant to Greece in accordance with Article 3 and conjunction with Article 10 of the Dublin Regulation. In the Court's opinion, Belgium subjected the asylum seeker to widespread inhuman and degrading treatment caused by the shortcomings of the Greek system. The scope of the EU competences, according to Article 78 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, as a shared competence means that the asylum legislation must comply with the principles of subsidiarity and proportionality, which require limiting the activity of the EU level only if the result cannot be sufficiently achieved at the national level. Article 79 of the treaty speaks of measures, thereby indicating the admissibility of using the principle of proportionality in regulations, directives and decisions. And it also applies to financial support and activities that usually have a legal basis in decisions. The purpose of the provision of the treaty is generally interpreted in connection with each other and may affect both the application of the principles of subsidiarity and proportionality as well as the interpretation of secondary legal acts in relation to which it supports a re restrictive approach to vaguely formulated provisions, namely to the more often preferred responsibility of the member states. As to the delegating in the national law, the concept of integration of foreigners presupposes the significant transfer of competences precisely to self-government bodies of member states, which should play a key role, especially in the field of integration of foreigners. According to international treaties, each state has the right in the exercise of its sovereignty to admit into its territory such persons as it deems appropriate without the application of this right leading to a complaint by another state. Sovereignty as such, in accordance with international law, is given in relation to the jurisdiction of each state with respect to the population within its territory. 
This sovereignty applies without any limitation to persons who enter it from the state in which they are located and where they are persecuted for their beliefs, opinions, or political affiliation, or for actions that can be considered as political crimes. Thank you. Thank you so much for your voice. And now I would like to invite uh, the last presenter from Polish team to present stance on the same topic. Thank you so much. So, building upon the previous question, I would like to further elaborate on the close connection between refugee law and the principles we have discussed. Indeed, the principles apply in an almost identi identical manner to refugee law. Article 78 of the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union outlines the EU commitment to developing a unified policy on asylum, subsidiary protection and temporary protection. The, this policy aims to grant the appropriate status to a third country national in need of international protection while upholding the principle of non refoulement Importantly, this policy must alien with the Geneva Convention and the Protocol of January 1967 regarding the status of refugee as well as the pertinent treaties. In response of the EU migration challenges, the principle of attribution may justify action at the EU level, such as the establishment of a common asylum system. This system serves to ensure consistency and quality in refugee protection across the European Union. Member states return competence in matters concerning the recipient and asylum for refugees. This principle of subsidiarity and is manifested by permitting the EU to act only asylum procedures at common standards level, while the rest of the competence should remain within the preview of individual member states. The principle of proportionality finds relevance in societies where the EU introduces regulation for border protection to combat illegal migration. This regulation must be precisely tailored to address the actual threat and must not encroach upon the rights of refugees seeking asylum. The European Union and its member states share a complex division of competences in refugee law, guided by the principles of conferral, subsidiarity and proportionality. In practice, these principles must be taken into account during the development and in the implementation of refugee policies within the European Union to strike a balance between common interests and member states' sovereignty. Migration policies are the expressed through directives and regulation adopted in the EU level. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, that was the last speaker of our debate. And now I would like to ask, are there any questions for the attendees regarding the second panel? Have we, okay, we have uh, two questions. So the first question from the Central European team. And remember, you have uh, one minute to answer. Okay. So our question is, uh, with the emergence of new uh, technologies and digital platforms, how do you envision EU and member state co uh, competences evolving to manage migration and asylum processes more uh, efficiently and effectively? Thank you. I will be happy to answer. Uh, so, uh, in my opinion, in my point of view, the emergence of new technologies and digital platforms uh, really do present a unique opportunity for, for the European Union and its member states uh, to transform their competencies in managing migration and asylum processes. Uh, this evolution can be lead uh, to, to more efficient and effective um, system in several key ways. Uh, firstly, digitalization can streamline information sharing and the communication among member states. Um, it's really important, but I will move forward to, uh, to this, um, that artificial intelligence and the data analytics can play a crucial role in assessing and managing migration flows also as well. Um, but most uh, interesting for me is um, uh, use uh, of um, uh, is the use of um, uh, biometric technology in general. It's really interesting and it's worth to uh, take a look at it. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you, you very much. And it's time uh, for a question from Polish team. Uh, yes, it will be my question that um, after this uh, discussion, uh, I'm curious about your um, opinion uh, about the implementation of uh, objectives of international migration and refugee law in your countries. 
how does it look like from your point of view? In relation to the implementation of the goals, I would like to mention an extraordinary cooperation in this region. Uh, after the 2015 waves of, of refugees, uh, we could see that the Council of the, the European Union decided upon the relocation of, of the refugees in, in the member states. They were set certain quotas. However, some countries and, and the V4 countries decided differently. And for example, Slovak Republic uh, decided to file a lawsuit as well as with Hungary uh, against this decision under the Article 263 of the treaty. And, and the V4 countries in this relation promoted a unified opinion that the European Union should, should abandon the idea of this mandatory mechanism of, for the relocation of refugees. The, the need to, to protect their national sovereignty was presented uh, through, through this decision and, and uh, their power to, to fight for their own uh, sovereignty. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. The second part of our debate come to the end. Uh, I would like to thank you all speakers for high level of speeches and for follow the time rules. Also thank you or our audience for staying with us. Thank you for your attention and see you next time. Now I would like to ask to sum up of, uh, the debate, Mr. Marcin Vielec, the director of Institute of Justice. Joanna, thank you very much. So I think that the debate uh, was very interesting. Uh, yes, indeed, the migration process is currently one of the most important challenges at this time. And you presented many different options, uh, many different conclusions. We could find many interesting proposals, reasons, comments in each of you view. As, uh, as Plato said, first of all, you need to know what you are talking about, or the whole discussion will be for nothing. You knew what to say and how to say it. Congratulate. It was a fruitful and extremely enjoyable debate. Thank you very much for all. Congratulations. And in this time, I invite, I hope next year, to the further edition of the Oxford debate. Thank you very much. Dobrze. Sorry, for the start. Okay, so, uh, with the great, great pleasure, I give the certificate of attendance for our friends, Professor Hedeshilagi. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you so much. Oh, that's the famous poster. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. So, the participant, Rebecca. <laughs> Congratulate, thank please. Thank you. Agata, Polish Agata. Thank you. Lea, on Polish. I don't know. <laughs> Lena, Lena, <laughs> Lena. Who knows? <laughs> but Sofia. Sofia. Thank you so much. Sofia, Sofia. No, no, no. Thank you so much. So. Okay, and the Polish team, yes? Yes. <laughs> Tomasz. Tomasz is a veteran. <laughs> Twice. Participate. This is for you. Yeah, you. <laughs> Agata. On Hungary, Agata. Agata. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. This is for you. Thank you. <laughs> Julia? <laughs> it's universal global, Julia. <laughs> Not Julia. Yes. Thank you so much. And this is for you. Thank you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and Joanna. <laughs> And and this and wait wait a minute and this is for you thank you very much <laughs> so I want to thank the moderators to our debate yes yeah, thank you Joanna it's like Oprah Winfrey <laughs> Joanna thank you very much and, and uh, so it is uh, for the for the. Central European Academy, but maybe I will send to post because it is maybe too difficult to carry out. Uh, Glass. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, 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 but in this time. However, we use, you know, the Polish airlines. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, we will telephone to the pilot. <laughs> yeah. And maybe pilot. <laughs> Go to the, to the, to the test, please. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks. Maybe. Thank you. <laughs> That's for the bait, I decide to close. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Super. Thank you. 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 Thank you.